if there is a holy grail for me that's the holy grail i did the pga coaching one of the things i took away from it was i'd never played so badly in my life and actually there's a whole world of information that most people don't know about i kind of want to go back in time and go to all the people that i was working with and say look i'm really sorry i just didn't know any better that would make you pretty powerful as a golfer i would say A few weeks ago, a guy called Stuart Armstrong sent me a direct message on Twitter. It got my attention because he said that he'd worked in the golf industry for 10 years in coaching and talent development, and he's now the head of coaching for Sport England. But what really got me interested was that he said he knew why a lot of the golf lessons that I'd had hadn't really helped, and in fact why some of them had actually made me worse. He's got his own podcast all about coaching and talent development, and he invited me on there to talk about my kind of experiences in trying to get better at golf and the different lessons that I've had and that kind of stuff. So I'll put a link down below to the full um, episode of that podcast if you want to go and listen to it. But in this video, I've just pulled together some of the most interesting things that I thought he said about the way that traditional golf coaching is flawed and a different approach which can actually help people get better. I've chopped out a lot of the bits where I was talking because I think anyone who's watched a lot of my videos will have seen a lot of the lessons that I've had and um, yeah, heard my thoughts on the kind of different ways of going about trying to get better. And obviously I didn't want this video to be two hours long, like we chatted for almost two hours on the podcast. So yeah, this video might make it seem like he was kind of dominating the conversation, but it wasn't like that at all. As I said, I've just chopped out a lot of the bits where I was talking um, because I think really the stuff that he said was will be more interesting and hopefully useful to anybody else who's trying to find a way to get better at golf rather than just hearing me waffle on like normal. So yeah, I'll stop waffling on and here you go. I did the PGA coaching um, course back in the day when you know you had the you could be a level two coach and. Um, yeah, it's a really interesting experience, but like one of the things I took away from it was I'd never played so badly in my life. Mm. Like I knew everything about the swing. I'd learned loads about impact factors and swing path and face angle and all these different dimensions. And so I knew exactly why I was pulling it straight left into the bunda, but I couldn't do anything about it. Yeah. And it, it, that was a, so for me, that was kind of like really interesting about like how knowledge, you mentioned, you made reference to knowledge is power. Well, it can be, but it's interesting that it also can be hugely detrimental. And I guess the re reason I reached out is because like the, the sort of the coach in me uh, or the coach developer in me, I suppose, um, finds it very hard to stand by when I see somebody who's got those kinds of challenges. And I thought, well, I might be able to offer something here. I was saying to you, look, I think where your, where your heart is and where your kind of instincts are, around the the less technical position based aesthetic model of golf instruction um and you sort of your kind of your shift to say well actually i feel as if the more natural approach if you like or the more um uh i, I guess flexible approach seems to be where you feel you resonate strongest with mm. Lots of people, I think, have that experience, but exactly like you, because sort of sports science, if you like, and golf science in particular, has increased in its sort of um, popularity and not just popularity, but also the information available based on some of the scientific principles has turned golf instruction into you know a well firstly it's an entire it's a very lucrative um industry mm. and in terms of whether it's practitioners teaching it or people writing about it it's what the golfers want to consume you know so technical information when there are reams and reams and reams of information about the golf swing and yet when in actual fact when we start to begin to look at it you know there's actually some real differences between how people become proficient at things and your you know your your experiences i think are probably really resonating and and your intuition now is quite strong it's just a question of whether you can kind of like you know you trust you what you, you want to go with your intuition but there's that part of you the kind of rational part of you that's saying but but maybe this, maybe that's just too easy. Like you say, maybe you've been questioning yourself. I don't think it is easy, by the way. I think to make that commitment is actually really quite a challenging thing to do because you're going against orthodoxy. 
mm. you know you're you're having to like actively resist what is 90 percent of the information that's out there you know you have to actively choose to to reject all of that pretty tough call so i guess i i guess what i wanted to do was to almost reach out and say you're on the right path you know you really are and actually there's a whole world of information that most people don't know about around skill acquisition and uh learning and development and all those sorts of things that you know i could kind of share with you a little bit in all the sports i've played whether it's cricket or hockey or anything else you know we played lots of games and we and we developed little games that we could then do whether there's just two of you or what you know whatever it is and you could just like work things out and that's how lots of young people get good at stuff you know it, it, lots of the kids no there's no surprise like within little team games that i coach that lots of the kids who present as you know quite good happen to have siblings usually older siblings you know mm. so, someone to play with yeah you know which is where the skills get developed um so and i think and it's why so I, I did that lots of designer games you know we used to i used to create games i used to have to create games actually i've told this story before but i used to have to create games to get my younger brother to continue to bowl at me at cricket because he'd get bored, you know, because he couldn't get me out. So mm. I would like, I said, right, I'll bat with a stump and I'll put pound coins on the stumps and I'll put five stumps down, you know, to give him a chance to motivate. So he gets some sweets at the end of it. Um, and I'd get him to bowl at me off 14 yards and all this sort of stuff. So he, it felt a bit faster to me. So I, what I was doing, I didn't realize this at the time, but what I was actually doing was like, I was sort of putting constraints in place to make the, the task harder for me. And, mainly my driver was to keep him motivated to continue yeah. to bowl so um we and we did all sorts of games like that and and now i realize that when i then did my coach ed they taught me completely the opposite of that it was teach technique so this is how you teach someone to hit and this is how you teach someone to slap the ball this is how you teach someone to dribble and it was all very static and quite isolated and there was there was <clears throat> very very often no opponents at all so you just had a you know, dribbling around a cone or something along those lines. Mm -hmm. And then you go into like, later stages. And then, you know, I had a relatively successful career as a coach, you know, and I was, I took teams into national leagues and promotions and everything else. And then I realized after a while that I sort of reached a bit of a plateau, similar to you, you know, in my kind of journey. And, I, and the reason was because, you know, my, I kind of reached the limits of my skills toolbox. And, and then what I realized quite quickly was I was teaching people how to become good at something in exactly the opposite way that I became good at it. Mm. And so I then had to, went on a different journey. And that's when I started finding out things like, oh, well, it turns out that the all conquering Olympic gold medal winning coach of Australia uses something called designer games. Well, that's interesting. And then I find out something called teaching games for understanding, which has been around since the seventies. And then I find there's game sense. And then I find there's a load of, and then I find I go down this further rabbit hole and I start finding out, you know, there's a scientific community that's sort of around this idea of what they call non-linear pedagogy. So non-linear coaching, how do you teach people in a sort of non-traditional way? Then there's a new thing that's called ecological dynamics. And what the hell is that? And that's all about, you know, an entirely different branch of psychology that looks at the way humans interact with society in a different way. And, I'm, oh, God, now I'm in a massive thing. So I've been on this big, big learning curve. And actually, in many ways, I kind of want to go back in time and go to all the people that I was working with and say, look, I'm really sorry. I just yeah. didn't know any better. Yeah. <laughs> so that, that's kind of been the journey. I've been on. It's very similar. It was saying my experience with the PGA, and I don't want to decry the PGA because I don't think they're alone in this. I think the vast majority of sports organizations that run coach education stuff, it's based on a particular um, scientific, theoretical understanding of skill acquisition, which is this linear one, you know, a bit like you were talking about earlier, where you develop technique and then you apply it in context and it, tran and, you know, and it, and it transfers. Yeah. And that's the kind of way everyone's sort of taught in their coach ed. And that's the sort of basis through which actually much of our education systems work. But in the physical realm, that's quite limited. And actually, the physical realm, this alternative viewpoint, would argue that actually you don't get better at physical tasks by thinking about the physical, learning about the physical task in your brain. And then your brain transmitting information down into your body to become good at physical tasks. In actual fact, the reverse is true. The more you think about it, the worse you are at motor, motor control, it turns mm -hmm. out. So actually, the reality is, is that like what we're trying to find is how do we how do we learn to become really highly proficient in motor, motor tasks through doing motor tasks rather than learning and thinking about motor tasks? Most coaching or most... Uh, 
um, most of the ways people teach people to become proficient at sport is they give them knowledge about the activity. And what the sort of ecological space talks about is uh, it's about knowledge of or knowledge in the activity. So it's working backward from the activity and what can we draw from that rather than I'm going to give you some information and put it into you and then transmit it down. Mm. And that's the fundamental shift. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. I think because in golf, nothing is dynamic in the moment. Like, yeah. ball's not yeah. moving, nobody's yeah. got to pass it to you, there's no one trying to tackle you, et cetera, et cetera. It makes sense that you kind of think, well, I can just build this better motion technique or whatever and then just apply it each and every time. But there just must be something missing because... You know, there's never been more and higher sort of quality of information available, you know, in terms of launch monitors and videos and all that sort of stuff. But so the lessons, I guess, have never been better from that point of view. But the average handicap, I'm sure I've seen, hasn't come down in the slightest. Somebody who's been on the show we talked about last time, uh, who's been on the show a lot, a guy called Kendall McQuaid, who's instinctive golf is very much his concept, you know, sort of a nat more natural way of learning. He, he he kind of, I think, had this epiphany about this thing, like many of his uh, contemporaries, uh, and has just been on a sort of learning journey himself. And then just so happens that, you know, we've been friends for a number of years, and I've discovered this entire body of literature that's actually supporting many of the sort of conclusions he'd come to several years ago. But anyway, one of the things Kendall talks about a lot, and one of the quotes I'd love, love is, he says, the vast majority of golfers in the world are playing somewhere between hope and fear. Mm -hmm. You know, and very few of us genuinely have the uh, kind of um, the awareness, the level of awareness and understanding of how we're moving the implement through space and time um, that enables us to have confidence. You talk about confidence. Sometimes you just get into flow. So you have a very, you have a simplified thing. You're not, got, you're not full of technical thoughts. You've got a feeling. You play with that feeling. Everything flows. And that is flow. It's so fleeting, the times that you've played in flow in golf. You know, yeah. Sometimes it's just one shot. Sometimes it's a period of shots. Sometimes it's an entire round, but it's very fleeting. But when you touch it, it's something that's so addictive that you want to get back to it and you can't understand why. And then here's the real killer. And this is the real paradox. The more you try, the more elusive it becomes. Yeah. Yeah. It's, um, <laughs> it's such a, I mean, yeah, you've hit the nail on the head with that kind of feeling of the flow because I've had it in a round and it's weird. It's like, it feels great, but I'm almost counting down the holes and just hoping that it lasts and gets me over the line <laughs> um, because I know it won't last forever. I'm just like, well, hopefully it at least lasts the next five holes and I'm in. And then, mm. you know, I can worry about it for the next round next week or whatever. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I think it was um, Jack Nicholas said it takes like a thousand shots to build confidence. And it takes one bad one to completely destroy it. And it's so true. Like I could have been playing really well for weeks, you know, across several rounds. And I hit one particularly bad shot or, you know, maybe two at the most. And suddenly I'm like, well, what's happened here then? Everything's gone completely wrong. I've got to question everything I've been doing. I think that the problem we often have with, uh, or we have had in my view, with uh, say, for example, coaching and learning and developing is, and I think you've experienced this, is that what we're not, what I'm not saying is just, just play, just enjoy it and you'll, you'll get better. Because like you say, your instincts are right. There's no more guarantee of, that leading to improvement than there is the other mm. necessarily but what there is about enjoyment and play and just finding you know kind of more of a sense of well-being within the game is it it's more it's it's less likely to do as much damage you know because like for example you gave up the game you know it was so disillusioned you gave up the game well that, that mm. can't be right can it so there's definitely less potential damage by just being focused on enjoyment, play, et cetera, et cetera. And by the way, this is one of the reasons I talk about this so passionately because I'm, I want, you know, people who work or coach young kids to be able to give kids experiences that aren't going to be, lead them to drop out because they find it so hateful. So, but in, 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 in the case of your talk, what you're talking about here is there is actually a middle ground. There is a way to kind of keep it sort of centered around enjoyment, well-being, everything else, while still improving. 
And so I, this for me is almost a bit like the, if there is a holy grail, for me, that's the holy grail. You don't have to compromise. So I call that the broccoli burger. You know, it's tasty, but it's nutritious as well. Right. So you're hiding the veggies in the lasagna is the other phrase that I've heard people right. use. So this is one of the reasons why, like a, um, you, I think, would, would derive, in my opinion, much more enjoyment from your practice and much more. And you'd also derive much more value from your practice, more bang for your buck, if you like. If you took this, if you use the sort of ecological perspective, which is this sense, this notion that. We have to have to use the environment in which we play and try and um, simulate that as much as we can in our practice as much as we can to play the kinds of shots or do the kinds of things that we are likely to be challenged by in the game so that when we find them in the game, they seem less novel, they seem less new. Right. So this is this notion of kind of creating an enriched practice environment. The vast majority of practice environments are sterile, flat lie. You know, if you're on a mat, it's a completely, you know, it's, a, it's nothing like turf. But if you're on turf, then often we scrape a nice, a nice lie for ourselves. Mm -hmm. It's flat. There's no there's no consequences to missing target. All of these different things. So not to say we don't practice on a range, there's ways of practicing on a range that makes it more enriched. But the vast majority of our practice is so removed from the actual, the realities of playing that it's really impoverished. There's a guy called, a coach called Graham McDowell, not the, not the US Open champion, a guy up in uh, Scotland called Graham McDowell, who does his phrase, he talks about impoverished practice environments. And it's a really fascinating area that's really, I think would be, be really fascinating for you to explore. So without wishing to go into all the detail of it at once, <laughs> yeah. can you give me an example of kind of what that would look like? Say if I was going to go to the range this afternoon, so rather than hitting 50 balls, trying to think of, you know, the technical thing that I'm trying to implement or whatever, what would that look like um, in that type of practice? So is the range the only place that you could go to is the first question I would ask. Um, <laughs> Let's say in the time you've got, you're going to have to use the range, right? Okay, we'll use that as an example, right? So for example, so what, so there's a lot of different things you could do. It would all depend on what it was that you, what, it, what, what area of the game it was that you wanted to explore, for example. Mm. So yeah, what, so, yeah, go on. Yeah. So I feel generally that I know how to practice short game putting. And if I do enough of it, there are improvements. I've seen it before. And I felt like. What do you do in your short game practice and your putting practice as a matter of interest? Um, so when I made the most progress, I had a kind of spreadsheet of different, um, I guess you'd call them games, sort of mm -hmm. skill tests and yep. things like that, Yeah. Um, which I did, yeah, both on the putting green and sort of in the short game area. Um, and yeah, it was quite prescriptive. So I knew how many of them I was going to hit. I had sort of a target score. And I would kind of track that to see if I was making progress over time and that kind of thing. Um, so I feel fairly okay with that side of it. It's just with the long game. So whether it's, you know, hit driver or full irons or whatever. Um, yeah, that obviously tends to be on the range um, that I'll be doing that sort of practice. And it's there where I feel like, yeah, I don't honestly know if, all the range sessions that I might have done across the last six months have actually made any difference. So um, what I would suggest you do, you did, for example, so give me an example of one of the skill, you call them skills tests. I would call them games because they are kind of gamified, aren't they? Mm. So give me an example of one of the skills tests you would do in your short game. Um, so for example, I might give myself three relatively easy sort of up and down opportunities, three kind of medium and three hard ones. Um, and yeah, obviously see how many I can get up and down from those positions. Um, repeat that perhaps like a few times to different holes on the nice. shipping green. So that's a, that's an example of a game. I think it's called par 18, isn't it? Yeah. But you, you've, you've added a bit of extra spice. So you've got the kind of mild, the mild three, the slightly spicier three, and then the really hot three. Yeah. yeah. And you see, and you're giving yourself a score as to how, how often you get up and down. Mm -hmm. And your par is like 18 as much as possible, so ideally, yeah? Yeah, so if you get up and down every time, yeah, for that, yeah. Yeah, you get 18. Okay, brilliant game. So 
we could design a similar game for long game, a par 18 game of long game, right? Where you hit, you hit a driver or a three wood or something you would hit off the tee and then a fairway, a fairway club to a target. So driver to target, do I hit fairway one point? Do I then convert that by hitting an iron with the next shot to a, within a proximity of another target? And if you get that, that's the equivalent of par 18 for your long game. Yeah, it's so strange because obviously I was talking about, you know, I'm confident the short game practice works. And, you know, that was one of the examples that I've used. But immediately when you said that, I'm thinking, well, how's that going to help with the long game? Because it's testing how good I am, how good my swing is, say, but how is it improving it? So it's not, it's not necessarily going to improve your technique because you're hitting one shot at a time. But remember, technique and skill are not the same. And the assumption is, is that if you prove your technique, you can transfer it uh, to the performance environment and it will transfer. And I think through bitter experience, you've pretty much proven that hypothesis wrong. Mm. So what we're saying, we're going to try an alternative here, which is to say, actually, let's not practice that way. Let's practice the, the other way around. Let's practice from the performance environment and see if our ability to adapt to particular tasks uh, is... We, we can do. So for example, if you were to take your par 18 example, so using the same practice test that you've just created for the long game. Oh, and by the way, you already, uh, I'm just going to challenge a little bit now. So forgive me, but like you already said to me that you, you got improvement from doing par 18 practice in your short game or stuff like that, right? Mm -hmm. You saw improvement of that. Why wouldn't that transfer to the long game? Yeah, I don't know. That's why I said it does seem strange, <laughs> but yeah, I just, to me, it feels all that will do over time is give me an idea of just how good or bad I am at that skill. But I think I feel like with the short game, I've got enough inherent, not just knowledge, yeah. but physical yeah. skills not that I can apply. Yeah, you've got knowledge in. Like the the practice the doing, hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. I've got the faith that actually I've already got what it takes to be a scratch level chipper or you know pitching. So therefore, I just need to like keep drilling it and play the games and trying out different things and make sure the skills are kind of on point. Um, it's almost yeah. It feels like I'm just sort of trying to like yeah make sure kind of I'm at my best with those things, but I'm already. It's in there. Whereas with the long game, it feels different. I feel like there's something lacking and doing those kind of tests and games will <laughs> reveal to me that, yeah, it is lacking, you know. So but what if you reframe that? What if you reframe that actually it, it, you don't, you, you have got a scratch level long game because it's, it's exhi exhibited itself on occasion, just maybe not as regularly as you would like. Yeah. I mean, that sounds nice. I just, <laughs> it's much it's much harder for me to accept i don't know maybe that goes back to what we we're talking about about the kind of focus of the positive versus the negative and that kind of thing um but yeah even when i was scoring well and that kind of thing i still felt like more confidence in my short game whereas if i turned up to play with somebody who i'd never met before who was a decent golfer or say if i'd gone to play a tournament somewhere um and they were kind of looking at me, I would think, oh, you know, I hope my long game doesn't kind of let me down and embarrass me here. Um, because... you, so you, what I hear you saying is that you, uh, you feel like you own your short game more than you do your long game. Yeah, definitely. Um, now, some of that might be, if I may be so bold, might be because you've outsourced your long game for too long. Hmm. So actually, I wonder if it would be an interesting experiment if you were to take a similar approach to your long game as you have done to the development of your short game. So I imagine partly part of the reason your short game is good is because you spend quite it's one of the things that you can easily do. You don't you know, you can when you're younger, particularly, you can spend a lot of time like messing around on the sides of greens and shipping and putting and all that sort of stuff. But you maybe don't spend as much time doing that as your long game. But also because you've been on this quest and you like you said, you know, you're full of knowledge. You've got the curse of knowledge about your long game. So you no longer own it. So I wonder if you worked, if you tried to take a similar approach to your short game as you did to your long game, 
and just track progress over time, it would be really interesting. Now, there, there is a reason for this, by the way. And uh, the, the, rash, the, the scientific underpinning of you doing, say, par 18 for your long game is, and I'm not saying do that exclusively, by the way. I mean, if you, know, you want to work on feelings and you know, strikes and things, by all means, do that. That's fine. But just make the sort of basis or the formation of your practice more of that or work backwards from it. So do par 18, discover something in that par 18 test like yeah, like I'm finding I'm struggling to shape the ball this way or that way or whatever it might be. And then work on that slightly away from that, but but at least working on that particular task rather than kind of going there sort of semi-blindly or maybe with an idea of a drill or something you want to work on technically and then trying to apply that to the task. Work the other way around, work backwards and play with that. I think what you probably find is that because your practice has purpose and it has more realism, not, not, it's not entirely faithful. Uh, what you'll find is that then when you come to the environment, you're more used to the idea of, and also, by the way, I would also recommend trying, if you can, to do as much of the routine that you use prior to your shots mm -hmm. in your practice environment, something I imagine that you do already. But, you know, just in case you get like I do from time to time, where you just end up wailing away with balls almost mindlessly. Oh, yeah, like, a lot of, hearing, hearing a lot of that. <laughs> like a lot of us do. So my recommendation would be, and it would be really interesting just to sort of do an experiment with this for a period of time and to see what happens. Because you're clearly someone who's happy to track progress, you know, spreadsheet it and all this, that and the other. It would just be a really interesting thing to do. And it's not foolproof. And I, I'm, I can't give you any guarantees right here, right now. This will definitely work. But I would be really interested to see what experiences you had through that process. Yeah, one question. So if I was doing that nature of practice on the range, um, is there any benefit other than time efficiency to being on the range versus just playing holes on the course? Because say if I'm hitting driver six iron, obviously if I'm on a hole, that, that's what that requires. That's what I'd be hitting and therefore... I would have, like you mentioned, the kind of uneven lies potentially and that sort of stuff. Yeah, it's, it's um, time efficiency. You know, you could get through 18 holes or nine holes in half an hour or an hour, that, whereas it would take you two and a half hours or two hours or whatever it would be on a course. So time efficiency is one thing. Um, also, uh, the ability sometimes, uh, well, I mean, I would. that's why I asked you the question, do you have to be on the range? If you can go on the course, I would go on the course. But yeah, I would... If you, Go on. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, one thing I thought is um like a seven hole kind of par three course um at Royal North Devon where I'm a member. And because again, I felt like my range sessions feel so hit and miss. I don't know if they're really making any difference at the moment. I was thinking, well, what if I just every time I was gonna go to the range didn't and then I can get around that in kind of half an hour. Um and okay, the longest shot is probably 130 yards, but there's obviously more focus to it. I'd be hitting chip shots when I miss the greens because the greens are absolutely tiny. I think it's like one of the hardest par three setups you could find anywhere. Um, but if I got dialed in with that and then potentially if I spent a bit of time on the range just sorting out my driver, that's kind of both ends of things kind of dealt with. Um, yeah. And what you can do is you can, you can um, play with variability. So, you know, you could go around that seven hole course, you know, a couple of times, two or three times, each time raising the level of challenge. So, for example, the first time you might play off the tees, but the second time you might you might go, right, I'm going to simulate a bad driving day where I'm playing from the rough. So you'd play the same seven hole course, but from the rough. Yeah. See what you could score from the rough. Um, play different hole, play different clubs. So simulate a wind day, like when you've got like wind direct, you probably will get wind anyway. So it's probably easy enough to simulate it, yeah. but like, you know, play knockdown shots. Um, and so I'm going to play that this course only playing knockdown shots, play half swing shots, all these sorts of different dimensions so that you're just challenging yourself in a range of different ways. That That's not just full swing time after time after time with the same club. And while doing that type of practice, not, putting much focus on anything technical nothing well okay sorry that's not entirely true there may be uh sensations and feelings that you want to sort of explore within but i if it was me i would try and 
There's an old phrase in The Legend of Bagavance, one of my favourite golf movies of all time, one of my favourite movies of all time, where he says, you're trying to stop thinking without falling asleep. Yeah. So my view would be whenever you're in the performance or the practice space, wherever possible, you don't want to be in the thinking space. You want to be in the doing space. Mm. That doesn't mean you don't work things out strategically or you don't maybe even do some practice swings behind the ball thinking, I need to yeah, I need to think about this. thing." But once you get to that kind of performance space, it's purely about target, isn't it? Um, and so, but I personally, where possible, would try and limit the amount of technical information. And it's kind of what's natural for you as well, because... Like if if part of your like understanding of the game comes from some of those ideas technically, I don't think you should rid them entirely because they're an important life raft. But it would be interesting to experiment with it, wouldn't it? No technical information whatsoever. Let's see what happens. And then try yeah. it with some more technical information. Yeah, I mean, I think obviously if you present me any kind of shot, then there's stuff that naturally comes in as in I know roughly how to get that shot. So if you say hit a knockdown shot, obviously without having to think particularly, there are certain things that I would just do naturally. Um, so yeah, perhaps that's kind of the level of technical input that would be there. Whereas yeah, the way I've been thinking about it is right. I'm trying to find these swing thoughts effectively, which are going to be my kind of secret weapon that I can then take to the course and implement on each shot and they're going to produce better results. Um, yeah, we, I mean, it is such a illogical game, I think, because like I said before, I know that when I played well, I haven't been doing that. Yeah. Um, so I know that deep down, but then I'm still trying to do it a different I've, way. I've described yeah. golf and I've described sort of improving in golf as the mother load of counterintuition. Yeah. <laughs> the problem with technical information like the stuff we get taught to us, instructional stuff, stuff we don't actually own, you know, what I, what I referred to earlier as knowledge about. Mm. The problem with it is, is it, it works until it doesn't. And then it's really brisk. So it's really brittle. So the minute it's challenged, often it doesn't work. And then we almost then think, right, well, go get, get rid of that and move on to something else. Mm. And then we're searching. What's the next thing I can look for? What's the next thing I can look for? What's the next kind of life raft band-aid I'm looking for? Which is one of the reasons why I advocate being in the being more in the kind of in the sort of ownership learning learning of thing because actually then it's not what you do it might take you a while to sort of make a discovery so it sometimes feels a bit slow laborious painful but when you do start to develop things and develop things it's actually really quite powerful and very resilient because it's not based on some sort of artificial notion of performance it's based on your own experiences of performance which mm -hmm. is much stronger yeah the thing is it makes so much sense, but I think it probably does take quite a lot of fortitude because mm, you're right. Say, you know, I'm going to play four rounds this weekend at really nice golf courses, you know, really hoping to do well. Um, so if I start off not thinking about much and trying to kind of just own my own swing and it's going really badly, how long do I persevere with that? Um, without starting to just grasp for these different like swing ideas and bits of knowledge that you know I've taken in over the years and the hope that one of them works. And by the way, for here and now, because that's what you've always known, you should always grasp for that stuff. Because if you can find something that helps you, by all means do. I would never advocate for that. But what I'm talking about more is as you move into the future with your continued learning journey, mm -hmm. what might be interesting would be if you could, you know, if you could build kind of a if you could build for example the kind of basis of understanding experiential understanding around your long game that you have in your short game that would make you pretty powerful as a golfer i would say again not foolproof but powerful mm. yeah no, that does make sense because i feel like yeah i definitely don't own my swing i feel like i've been trying to get rid of it and <laughs> replace it with a better one for years um, which, yeah, hasn't really worked. And we just have to accept that performance in golf from shot to shot and round to round is something that is elusive. Mm -hmm. But the elusiveness of it, it doesn't necessarily mean that we should try and kind of like rid ourselves of whatever it is we know or grab onto something else and just continually, you know, be like a, a frog on a lily pad on the next like instructional fad. It's more saying that's just the nature of the game. Mm -hmm.
Yeah, no, I, mean, I definitely felt that. I think I'm almost too desperate and too hungry to find something. So, yeah, I'm always looking for it or it presents itself. Um, even if I'm playing with somebody who I think, oh, they're better or they're just playing better, I'll be looking at what are they doing? You know, what can I get from that? So there's this like huge thirst for the answers. But yeah, that can manifest itself in that leaping from one thing to the next. And um, obviously as well, it's interpretation. So even if it was the right answer, the way I then implement that might not be quite right. So um, that's even more difficult to kind of get the right thing and use it in the right way. Yeah, exactly. You mentioned deliberate practice earlier on. And um, one of the interesting things about deliberate practice that people have kind of lost is, so in the discussion about it, and the guy who originated it, Anders Ericsson, he died not long ago. And um, he was he's really, really, really sad about the way his research was sort of a little bit misinterpreted by Gladwell. Mm. Um, and it became all about quality, sorry, all about quantity, all about the number. Yeah. You know, like like you can imagine. And I do know actually there are parents who've done this. They're counting off the hours off the off the fridge fridge thing, you know, the idea bit or oh, nine thousand nine hundred and ninety-nine, and then the next thing is I've got a gold medal. Yeah. It it and the problem is it's not about practice quantity, it's about practice quality. And that's the thing that's been lost because deliberate practice is really tough. Yeah. And interestingly enough, when you really look into what deliberate practice looks like, and albeit his research was done in music, which is slightly different, but in a, it's always about, you know, you're really kind of mindful. And it's it's really um, linked to the performance as close as close as possible, and it's deep. You know, um, Coyle Daniel Coyle talks about deep practice. So it's actually about this idea of creating depth into your practice. And so I actually think a lot of our practice is very, um, uh, you know, kind of surface level. We never get into the depth. So I guess what I'm trying to advocate advocate there is uh, more of a uh, a deep practice approach by equating the performance environment as much as you can. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, obviously you mentioned the long game version of the PAR 18. Mm. Um, do you know other places to go for like more kind of stuff to do? Because I guess, you know, um, rather than just only doing that. No, I mean, there's lots of, uh, I, I think there's lots of uh, ways we can do this. So there is a course that was run, and I'm not sure if it's still being run, called by uh, Pete Arnott and Ian Renshaw. So Ian Renshaw is an academic based in Australia who has taken a backyard games. He's one of the, uh, uh, one of the big advocates or the big sort of internationally bit of a, if, if there's such a thing in the academic community as a global megastar, he's one of them, right? Uh, he wrote this book here called uh, Nonlinear Pedagogy and Skill Acquisition. So uh, he's one of four authors, Ian Renshaw. He's based in Australia. He's from the UK. Um, and his son play, has played test cricket for Australia, Matt Renshaw. And he plays backyard games of cricket, played a lot of backyard games of cricket with him. Mm -hmm. And uh, obviously has reached the elite level and plays as a sort of professional cricketer. Now he did, a, he created a course with uh, Peter Arnott, who's a Scottish based golf pro, who's very aligned to this approach. And I think it's called, I want to say it's called play like tiger or something like that. Uh, I don't know why they've done that, but it's a uh, very similar based on this. And there was another course that they did with Pete, uh, with, um, Graham McDowell, who I was telling you about earlier on, uh, along similar lines. And they came up with a whole load of performance games um, around different ways that you would challenge yourself to, you know, explore this sort of thing or task, what you might call task led practice. So a bit like Adam Young, you know, he said to you, instead of hit, if you're hitting off the toe, try and hit it off the heel. That's called differential learning. And, and then you start to develop the feel because you're the one being the learner. You're the one doing it. It's mm. not them teaching you. So task-led practice is a big part of this uh, as well. Hence, the PAR 18 is just a big task, isn't mm. it? You've got a, a target, a set you're trying to achieve. You're trying to hit some targets. You get points if you do and points if you don't by giving me a task, not an instruction. So that works technically. You know, you, so you develop technique that way you know, by achieving a task. So if I, do, if I do the hit the heel task, I can now hit the ball out the heel. Hmm. So that means I could, if I wanted to, hit the ball out of the toe, which means I could, if I wanted to, hit the ball out the middle, yeah. in, theory, in theory, but that's how it works. Rather than and me giving you some sort of thing, oh, well, what you've got to do is you've got to rotate your wrists in the backswing and then you'll get the middle of the club and all those sorts of things. That's the traditional way of doing it. Yeah. The non-traditional, non-linear way of doing it is I, I would 
be given a task, I would work on the task and I'd see if I could perform that task. And then I, that would actually develop my capability, technical capability. What I would say is, I actually think you've already got quite a lot of technical capability, right? I just think that what you need to do for your own practice, and if, you know, I highly recommend working with somebody like Kendall, he does, he does in, in my opinion, just, he just makes you so much more skill. You're just more capable of doing more things with a golf ball. Yeah. I couldn't, I couldn't have hooked the ball ever. Like, why would you want to? Well, sometimes you do. And now I can I'm kind of on demand when I need to. Um, so, you know, in theory, if you can do that, you can then do the opposite and then you can start to flip it around. But I, if I'm, so that's how I work technically wherever I can. And then if I'm working in a, but actually where I'm, where possible, if I'm on my own, I want to try and create an environment where I'm trying to practice as close to the environment as possible. So I kind of do what you said, really, I don't go and play six holes mm -hmm. with three balls and play different shots, you know, play the, the easy, the medium and the hard, um, or I'll go around the short game course and challenge myself similarly and all those yeah. sorts of things. Yeah. And I'm, you know, I've just come up with a few things there, but we could spitball loads of different activities and come up with a whole range of different games that we could sort of try and play. Yeah, it's just interesting when you were talking about, obviously, when you're actually working with him in person, that the task might be what to me feels more technique-based Technical. still. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, you know, like I was recently exploring a bit of a stack and tilt type golf yeah. swing, yeah. Um, which felt like a kind of middle ground because obviously it is still focusing on what you're body is doing and what the club is doing um but felt quite simple you know so it's not this super technical thing yeah, yeah. um so yeah i guess i'm sort of yeah just trying to work out how those kind of things fit into it and um so the difference would be would say there's something like the slack and tilt in many ways as well in many ways that actually probably is quite close like you say it's quite close to what we're talking about because you just basically went onto that practice activity with a series of tasks now they were sort of technical instructions because it was like right keep your weight on your left side bring the club more on the inside on the way in and all those sorts of things mm. now the way kendall would do that is he'd draw that out of you going right let's experiment with let's experiment with a task that involves swinging on one leg for example or swinging right. with your weight on one leg and that or weight on more on one leg let's experiment with that let's try experience the other one right let's find out where you feel most comfortable and where you seem to be able to get better impact into the ball and all those sorts of things. Yeah. So you'd be drawing it from you rather than giving you the instruction. Yeah, I know yeah. it sounds like a very nuanced difference, but it's quite an important one. Mm. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, but yeah, it felt almost like quite a fun experiment because it felt so different. Yeah. Um, I guess it also took away that idea of, right, I'm just trying to create a perfect swing. It was like, this is just something completely um different to what i would normally do um so then i was more open to just see what happened with it as well um, it's a form of it's actually a form of differential learning as well because what you've done is you've said right i'm going to do something that's a bit of an extreme from what i normally do yeah and then you'll probably find a middle ground yeah if i know something about what i've been doing and maybe this is confirmation bias but i'm i get more joy and more uh, satisfaction from coaching in the way like this mm. and the kids I coach seem to get far more joy and satisfaction and if the under 16s that I've been working with is a little bit of an experimental kitchen for the last however many years or anything to go by based on the way that they play now because I've been working with them for about eight years they are my proof that this whole thing works because they are super skillful individuals with brilliant game appreciation um but again, that might be because of other factors. It might have nothing, nothing to do with me. <laughs> well, no, it does make sense. Yeah, if I had, you know, a 14-year-old kid and I was trying to make them better at golf, I wouldn't be pushing them down this super technical way. I'd be getting them to experiment. So, yeah, it does make me wonder why I'm not doing the same for myself. <laughs> I hope you found the stuff that Stuart said as interesting and useful as I did. It's really made me think about trying a completely different way of getting better and just forgetting completely about positions and how my swing looks and just focusing on what I actually want the golf ball to do. I've got loads of different things that I'll be trying over the next coming weeks. So yeah, if you want to see those, then make sure you're subscribed to the channel. I've also had loads of people commenting and sending me messages lately saying, oh, I didn't realize you were doing golf videos again. And obviously I've been doing them now for like six months probably. So 
Um, yeah, I guess if you just make sure you subscribe, hit the bell thing and that'll tell you if I upload a new video and then you won't miss them. Um, if you want to like the video as well, way down there, that obviously helps and is appreciated. But yeah, until next time, I'll see you in the future. Don't